Okay, so this is the third of my Think Aloud. I think I've called them Speak Aloud and Talk Aloud, but it's actually Think Aloud um, sessions. Um, this time on my Eurorack system. Um, so, yeah, again, like all the other ones, um, I haven't really got a particular idea in mind. Um, I'm just going to make a patch and see where it leads me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one thing that I was trying yesterday was looking at the Felistry, the um, Felistry being um, kind of a, a complex um, dual function module with lots of other things, and I was kind of playing around with sync with that. I've already done some sync stuff, so um, maybe I'll play with something else. I really don't have that much of an idea about what to do. Um, one thing I was playing yes with yesterday was this bifold which is kind of a new module to me, um, the bifold being a, a wave shaper. I've already got a wave shaper in here, which is the same as the um, Surge triple wave shaper, or well, it is a Surge triple wave shaper, but in Eurorack format. Um, but this has kind of broken out some more wave shaping possibilities for me. So I might, I might play with that a little bit. It does some cool feedback stuff. Um, we'll just kind of see what happens with it. I might, as soon as I mentioned it, I might start with the, um, the Philistry. I don't often use the Philistry as a as an oscillator itself. I've got plenty of oscillators in here. I've got a complex oscillator by Frap Tools. I've got um, two uh, clones of uh, Bookler 158 in here. Um, and is that it for oscillators? Oh, and I've got the Morphogene and, and the um, Nano Rings. But often I don't use the Philistry itself as an oscillator, but it does sound good. Um, so if I kind of open this up, very similar to using a slope in the surge system we've got audio rate um, envelope up and down I'm using the um, the bipolar output one thing that I was doing yesterday was um, instead of kind of directly looping it um, I've been able to take another looping envelope, which is this one here. Let me just kind of play it. The second one. And I've been able to use that to synchronize using the input of the, um, uh, I guess the, the trigger input of the first Felistry channel. So... It's a bit different to normal sync. You, I mean, you get the subharmonics. Oh, that's interesting. So I'm just playing with the attack time of the... Um, of the original envelope, which is now being synchronized by another envelope. Um, I'm doing, I'm synchronizing that using the bipolar output of the second envelope, but what if I use the unipolar? Basically the same sound. Yeah, I guess it's just using the rising edge, whatever it is. What if I use just the end of, yeah, same thing because you're not actually hearing, it's not an input like it is in the DUSG in the surge for synchronization. Um, it's just forcing the envelope to start again rather than actually following a rising edge. And if it was following a rising edge, I'm just surmising that um, the change in timbre or the change in um, unipolar and bipolar would change the actual timbre of the, um, the envelope, but because it's just forcing it to start again rather than um, using it as a as an input, then we're not hearing that much, not hearing any change in the sound depending on the output that I use. But I do have this possibility to use oh, that's interesting. Possibility to to play with subharmonics. That makes, makes me think of something. I mean, I've just put that directly into the mixer, um, but I'm going to grab a cable here. 
I'm going to put that in a... <clears throat> I've got this four-channel LPG, which is um, a Sputnik thing, which is modelled after the um, Bookler 281, I guess. Um, so very similar to my 281E that I use. And I'll put that in my mixer channel. Now, my mixer channel actually has a VCA, but I like the, the combo pot because you get this kind of LPG opening here, which is cool. Um, and so there's a couple of things that I can do to play with that. Sync is, I, I mean, obviously I could use like a random source or something like that, um, or I could use some sequencing. I might actually start with some sequencing. Um, I'm gonna use the Ooster here, which is my main sequencer. There's four tracks. Each track has two CVs, two gates, etc. cetera. Um, reminiscent of the 250E, but it's actually got more functionality. Well, there's some things it can't do, um, many things it can do. Um, I've just got it blanked out. One thing that I like to do with the Philistry, sorry, with the um, Worcester is I like to clock it externally um, and then work with um, some kind of external um, trigger source to clock it. So I'm going to use... Um, I'm going to use a channel of the Sapel, which is my random source. It's a clock channel of the Sapel. And I'm going to start with that. And if I press play, I can change the speed of that. That's good. Now, I don't necessarily want 16 steps. Let's start with a few. How about we start with, we'll do seven. No, we did seven and another one. Let's do nine. So I'll go into here, which is the time base. Don't know exactly what it's called. Um, I'm just going to make it do nine steps. So zero out everything else. And what am I doing? I'm modulating the, um, the rise time of the Felistry. So um, there's no values yet. Open it up. I've got it on the full time. Oops, I'm going to go on the wrong one. Okay, so what's going on here is, is as, I, as I've got, um, I've just kept the CV mode in channel one as um, pitch which means it's doing it in, um, you know, one volt per octave um, tempered pitch. That's okay. It doesn't bother me too much because um, we're working with um, something that's not actually giving us pitch anyway. It's Well, it is, but it's it's working with the, um, the subharmonics, so um, I don't need something super granular. Um, so that's fine. Does it bring that up? with the shape a little bit it's kind of unusual for me to start with like a melodic sequence like this it's, it's, it's melodic in this very tempered way using subharmonics so it's not something i would usually do but i can roll with it That's cool. Oh, what? Oh, we've changed pitch. Okay, we changed pitch because I don't think my Felistry synchronizing oscillator is super stable. 
That's all right. Open that up. I'm just playing with the the LPG a little bit to get a sense of timbre variation. I might just play with the. I mean, that's fine. Okay, so I'm just thinking, it like, the timbre variation that I can get here is obviously doing a pretty subtractive side of things, um, working with a LPG, which is acting in this way, like a, a low pass. Um, and so I'm just playing with this, which is making me think about different um, gestures. Um, that's fine. So I mean, I guess what I could do, just as a as a just to play around with it, is I could work with um, different values on another channel of the um, another channel of the same track in Philistry. Um and I can just open them up. Why is that? Oh, no, that's the gate. Whoops. Okay, so I'm just working with all of the track, all of them at the moment. One thing that I thought was like maybe actually having them slew, so making it green makes them slew. Um, a little bit. Okay, that's pretty nice. Um, what I'm going to do here, though, is I'm going to do some CV mixing um, because it's making me think that I would like not only that one source to change the volume and the timbre, um, but also some kind of other source, so if I'm going to mix in some CVs using a 3 to 1 here. Um, so if I take, whoops, if I take this bit output here, I put the original CV source, which should go back to where we were. Um, do we go? Oh no, okay, there we go. Good. <laughs> some kind of other source maybe from the sapel that's driving it with everything no no okay I don't like that because in my mind's eye I had an idea of having, having something kind of jittering at a different rate so I might grab uh, one of these envelopes, maybe an envelope from Maths. And use that and kind of blend that in with this.
offsets a little bit. I'm changing the speed. Back to the Philistry itself. Change the timbre a bit. I mean, so that's, it's nice, it's quite different to what I would usually do. But it's got some life to it, which I like. I'm just not sure if this very tonal thing is what I'm going for. I guess I'm finding out what I'm going for. Okay, cool. So, I mean, classic me. That's making me think of um, a few things. So I've got some movement in dynamics and timbre, but that's in a very subtractive way. Um, there's a couple of other ways that I could have some timbral variation and some, some interesting um, dynamic changes to that particular sound. We're just working on one sound source at the moment. Um, one way would be to process it using a triple web shaper or something or to layer this original sound with a processed version of it which is what i've done in some other patches another thought would be like i'm synchronizing this but i also have the possibility um if i wanted to to bring in some um, frequency modulation of that sound now it's already a complex sound um so frequency modulating it might um Frequency modulating it might be a bit too harsh, but um, just as I'm talking, I'm thinking like, what would I frequency modulate? Do I frequency modulate the synchronizing oscillator? That's what I did in my um, Euro Surge patch. So we could try that. Um, I'm just gonna give it an index here. So I'm going on into the um, one, for all per octave, one volt per octave input of the synchronizing oscillator. And to have some kind of index control, I'm gonna go via a VCA. And then I'm just going to grab um, a sine tone from this Brenso here. Okay, so I've got the sign tone from Brenso, which is going through a VCA. I'm opening it up, which is frequency modulating the synchronizing envelope, which I've done previously. Um, what I could do instead of that is actually synchronize, sorry, actually frequency modulate the one that's being synchronized. Um, I didn't do that in my previous sync patch. Um, it should just like make it kind of wild. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's make it quite deeper by changing the fall time. Okay, cool. So any of the modulation at the moment, um, besides this jittering, very free running um, maths envelope is being synchronized from the Sapel. Um, well, well, the Sapel is just driving the sequencer. That's all it's doing at the moment. Um, 
so I'm having this kind of up and down um, of the timbre from the sapel from channel um, B of track one. I'm getting the change in the um, in the subharmonics, which has changed a bit here. That's more where we were to start with. Okay, so I've got two forms of modulation that are synchronized to the sapel, and then I've got this free running thing. What I could do is actually use the free running thing. Where I'm going with this, I guess, is that I was hand hand changing this VCA and it might be nice to automate that but it, I found a good spot when it was just kind of sitting more there when the original synchronization is less about sub harmonics and more just about tamper, timbre it does go down an octave when I've got it up high like that but what I could do is I could use the free running envelope take its um end of cycle and synchronize sorry clock the second sapel channel which is giving more sample and hold um with that and then so what i'll do here is i've got an offset on my vca but i'll i'll take the um this two divide by two, whatever the two n output of the Felist of the um, Sapel, put that as my CV source. So if I open that up at the moment, this one's down. So each time we have this jittering clock pulse, it might be too fast for this modulation. I'm not sure, but every each jittering clock pulse, the end of cycle should trigger a new value for the frequency modulation. with the FM modulator. I could change the overall speed of this. Okay, so classic jittering. So I'm playing with the um, fall time of the jitters, which is interesting. I'm playing with the fall time of the jitters, which is changing the speed of the modulation to the FM index um, that I've set up through a VCA. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that same Sepel channel, which is changing the VCA, to control that fall time that I'm working with. I mean, I quite liked um, slewing that. I mean, I have a slew inside the Sepel here. Um, but it's full range, so I'd need to uh, I'd need to attenuate it before going into. Oh, I can do that. Yeah, I'll att I'll attenuate um, the flux output of which is not coupled to the speed of the Felicity channel. So I'm going to go into channel three just because it's next door, um, and then I've got to choose whether or not the base speed of the jitters. Let's just turn down the original. And just hear the chitters. What's going on? Okay, cool. 
cool. So we've got to work out whether the base speed of the jitters is going to be fast or slow. We'll make it fast so that I can increase the positive the, of the attenuator to change the fall time. So I've got a fluctuating random voltage from the second output of the spell, second channel, the green channel. Okay, we can change the rate of the fluctuating voltage. Also, Okay, so I'll bring back in the original dynamic. Maybe it's a bit too much. Okay, I'm wondering then... Okay, this is what I'm wondering. As, okay, so as, as the fall time increases, so we get these slower jitters. Because I'm taking its, um, its uh, what's it called? <laughs> because I'm taking the envelopes, um, just normal CV out, uh, then as the full time increases, then obviously we're getting a longer um, decay time. I'm not sure that's what I want. I might want the jitters themselves to be always the same um, pulse width. Um, I mean, I say pulse pulse width, but really what I mean is um, rather than it being an envelope, I want a ping. That's probably what I want. I probably want a ping because it is an LPG and it will respond nicely to a ping. So how about we how about we do it this way? I know that the end of cycle is more of a gate. So if I were to um, double that, just thinking as I go here, if I were to double the gate, which is um, which is clocking um, the green felicity channel and use that as a ping, I don't think it would work the way I want it to because it's actually a gate, so it'll open up. Let's have a listen. Oh no, it does. It is a ping. Okay, so it's more of a trigger, which is confusing to me, but anyway. Okay, so that's better. So even if it, as, as it gets really slower, it's still just a ping. Okay, that's good, that's good. So that means that my envelope my other envelope can do the sweeps rather than both the ping and the envelope doing the sweeps. with this playing with the modulation oscillator that's interesting so the modulation oscillator is now some kind of multiple of the fundamental frequency it's getting a bit dirty Just to be a bit tricky about this, just listening to that, one thing that I'm thinking is that it's cool that the um, original envelope is going in and out in this 
quite interesting way. And the ping is being more or less um, audible depending on whether or not that um, original envelope is coming in and out. However, it's not an, uh, an analog or um, like a peak um, circuit. Um, so it's not kind of revealing and then um, dying down as the other one comes up. Um, but I do like that, that kind of um, ebb and flow where they're both kind of ebbing and flowing. And I can't really do that just by mixing those two. So just to be tricky, um, I'm going to grab the ping. I'm going to put it into a VCA because I've got lots of VCAs in this, six, in this section. Um, just for consistency, because I'm using the other fluctuating random voltage um, for time change, I'm going to use the um, fluctuating random voltage from the um, <clears throat> from the yellow side of Sapel. And I'm going to dial in how much um, uh, volume change there is on the ping itself. Now, this should work. I think this might be DC coupled, so I should be able to um, work with the trigger. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, so open that right up. And if I open this up, the offset, I should get ping. No, I don't. hang on. I'm down. <laughs> There we go, okay. Ping. Yeah, it's quite sensitive though. So all right, so let's let's di let's dial in this C B here. Yeah, that's what I want. And if I don't want it to disappear entirely, I can always open up the offset, but it seems quite touchy in terms of whether or not the trigger's um, audible or not. sequencer okay cool all right good um so that's interesting um there's some some wild movement going on um and i'm able to mix the two different cv sources that are controlling my lpg um so that's cool um that gives me like variation and performative options although we're talking tiny tiny little knobs here but that's all right um with a jittery source like this, like some of my other patches, um, a jittery source like this obviously makes me think, well, obvious to me, makes me think of panning. Um, but the thing is, is it, it's a, it's like a composite source, really, if you think about the kind of modulation that I'm working with. Um, so like if I were to just be working with those jitters, then Probably what I'd do is I'd do something like this just to patch it up just for fun. Uh, is I'd use a sample and hold external. I'm only using this sample and hold here instead of another channel of the Felistry because, sorry, of the Sapel because I know this sample and hold is bipolar and I don't have to attenuate or rescale. So. So I'm using the trigger itself to be the trigger input for a sample and hold, which is working off white noise, white noise being bipolar. And so then we've got our sample and hold output, which is giving us a new panning location for each trigger. However, because as I said, it's a um, composite source, as soon as I bring in this more, As 
as soon as I bring in the en envelope, which has got more, um, it's got slower movement to it, it's probably a little wild. I mean, I've had wilder panning, but, but if I've got the opportunity to do something different, I might. Okay, so in that case, what I'll do is um, I will use I will use that trigger for panning, but I'm not going to pan this source. This gives me an opening, an opportunity to start developing another source, which has got rhythmic a rhythmic relationship to what I'm working with. So um, let's just first of all take the panning. And so we know already that this next source, whatever it may be, um, is going to be panned by the same jitter. Um, so that gives me a bit of option. Um, cool. So, like, what could we do? I could I could start something completely different, um, or I could modulate off what we're working with. It's my um, often it's my preference to do that um, to actually work off what we're working with. Another thing that I thought, um, just because I love this particular module, is to start playing with um, just a bit of resonance in terms of delay. Um, so I've got this Sarajevo um, Bucket Brigade delay. Um, so we might just patch it up so that it's there available for us. Um, so if I open this up, probably too much feedback. Okay, so that's still the original source. That's fine. Cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I talked about the bifold before. I could use that for a source. Um, but what I also really like is this Kaminyak, which is the phaser. Um, I worked with a phaser in my Eurosurge patch. Um, so the thought would be I could just, I could process this particular sound, um, which would give me something else to work with. Um, but I'm, I'm going to be working with a source that is panned using um, a jittery math channel. Now, because I decided I wanted that um, ping rather than the envelope's CV output itself, I now have the op opportunity to play with um, the um, CV output of that jittery channel um, as a CV source for my next source because my next source is going to be panning at that rate so I might as well relate the actual sound and its um, and its rhythm to that so I'm going to go let's do this let's say I mean this is arbitrary but let's say we're going to go whatever it is we're going to go out of a um, out of an LPG into a bifold and the reason why I'm going to do that is because I really like um, the sound of a wave shaper, any kind of wave shaping post a VCA, um, because you get more temporal variation. Um, but what's my source going to be? So my source could be, um, I mean, what if I, um, what if I used, I mean, let's try this. It could sound dumb, but let's use the um, triangle output of the modulation oscillator that's modulating this source. Um, and I'll put that in to the VCA. So now the bifold's going nuts. Um, got a lot of options to play with here. A lot of feedback options. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of zero things out to be a little bit more normal. Um, and then I might go into, I'll take the mix out just in case we want to take something else into it. I'm going to put it into the Kaminyak phaser because I like this phaser a lot. And then its output will then go down here. Now, it could sound a bit wild and a bit dumb, but we'll see.
I don't know if I like using. I don't know if I like using the the CB source itself. Um, maybe I'll I'll double that trigger and just grab the trigger and see what happens. At the end of the day, the the sound. Just thinking about it, because I'm going through a VCA and then into wave folding. The wave folder um, should kind of tends to lengthen the sound. That's my experience. Like it, it'll give more harmonics, but it'll also kind of, um, well, it compresses the sound, right? Um, because it's a wave shaper. So it's compressing the sound, which means that any kind of articulation gets, um, you know, the transients get um, smooshed. So <clears throat> if I'm using a wide open um, CB channel, then um, the chances of that happening are, um, more possible and probable. So I'm going to, what I've done is I've, I've malted out the, um, the trigger again. I could just, I didn't need to malt out the trigger. That was dumb. Okay. I'm not going to do that. Um, I don't need to malt out the trigger because I'm clocking Sapel's channel on the G channel. Um, sorry, the, the green channel. <laughs> um, and that's giving me a clock output, which is just a trigger. So that trigger can be my CV source. And I wonder what that's, like. there we go. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm basically get grabbing another trigger. So that's good. What I don't have though is any dynamic variation over this that I'm really liking in the, I really like the dynamic variation of this. So let's take, um, let's relate them to, together. So they're related together ry rhythmically already um, because they're using the same trigger source. Um, and that trigger source is also panning things. Um, but this VCA handily has a um, negative output. Um, and so I can take whatever is controlling the volume here and then put that in the negative output and put that in to um, duck the volume. Is that correct? Um, duck the volume of my sound yeah so i'll use the the internal vco of this guy so we got that going on put that in there um and now we've got a cb source is that right no i need an offset in that case okay so i won't do that i, I won't use the internal vco because that requires an offset and this doesn't have an offset so I use this one over here like I'd patched up originally. Um, what I need then is I need this source coming from the Kaminyak to go into here. So when it's fully open without any modulation ducking it, um, it should just allow me to send this one in. Hang on, I got this around the wrong way. Um, no, I don't. What's going on? So we got input. Oh. Oh, no, I put it in the wrong input. Okay, there we go. Okay. okay, good. So if its default position is open, when I take the negative... It's probably too much. So the idea should be... As this one gets louder, this one gets softer, so they're ducking each other. Well, it's ducking. Well, where's the... What happened to the trigger? Why is that now...
hang on, what? Um, something's going on. I've put the... Um, okay, so this should be the output. But where's the input going? It's coming from this trigger, which is going... Oh, this one. Whoops, idiot. There we go. Okay, so as this gets softer, the other one should get louder. And as it gets louder, the other one should get softer. So I'm just going to dial that in. It's hard finding the... the right threshold. better. Oh no, it's because I'm not. No, I'm just playing with the fold position. And now I'm adding some feedback into this. Okay, so that's a bit complex what I've done um, just to get to some two sources, these two sources working against and with each other. Um, so we've got this one, which is the trigger. That trigger is going up and down using a fluctuating random voltage. Instead of using another fluctuating random voltage for volume, what I've done is I've taken the inverse of the fluctuating random voltage that's changing the volume of this trigger and I'm using that to modulate this one. I'm not sure how much I like, I, I still want it to be more articulate, so I'm not sure what I can do here. What if I changed around the order? So if I took, um, instead of the end of the chain of this sound being the Kaminyak, we go into the Kaminyak and then we wave shape the Kaminyak instead. And then come directly out of the bifold. It's probably going to be even milder. We'll see. It's cool. It's articulate, quite percussive. Or what? Because it's increasing the resonance of the Kaminyak. I like, I like those complex sounds. It's um, using the Kaminyak into the bifold. Um, it's remembering that the sound is just the, um, the triangle wave of the Brenso, which is the FM so um, source, FM modulator for my original source. So I'm taking that, I'm enveloping that um, using the same trigger that's doing the other triggering in my other source. Then it now goes into the Kaminyak first, which is my phaser, giving me a, um, some resonance 
and the ability to change its um, phase and, and therefore timbre, then that's going into the bifold, which is my wave shaper. Um, so now what that allows me to do is to start to think about how I can I like that delayed tail. Okay, so that means I can I can play with this Kaminyak a little bit. What I might actually do is I might malt out the um, the second channel here. This is all about efficiency. Um, I've got so many different. Um, well, it's about efficiency, but it's also about like trying to use what you've got and to make relationships between different parts. Um, so I've got lots of different channels that I can use in this um, Usta. I've also got the Tetrapad that I can use either performatively or as a sequencer. I've also got the Planar. So there's many things that I can do, but at the moment what could be interesting is to have a rhythmic relationship between, um, rhythmic and CV relationship between um, this opening um, that I'm getting from the CV, that one. And then use that to um, modulate the Kaminiak. So I'm going to, um, the Kaminiak being this source here. So I'm going to use second channel of math so that I can um, attenuate my external modulation. I'll put some external modulation in there. And then we'll see what happens. Okay. So let's have a listen without the pings, but with that original envelope on the original source. So I'm not hearing it all the time. So here I'm hearing that all the time. But it's because in the original source, without an offset, because it's an LPG, it's going down. So if I give up some offset, you hear that all the time. So we're relating pitch change to a volume and timbre change. So that's cool. So if I bring in... Okay, so I'm actually going to double the modulation and see if I can do some FM modulation on the Kaminyak from its internal LFO. That's cool. So it's got an internal LFO which can modulate it at the same time as taking the external modulation in. But I don't have dynamic control over that with a VCA. But it does have an LFO out. Cool. I can't change the depth. Right. I can't change the depth dynamically. It's just got a one, one pot. So I'm opening it up. Cool. So that makes me think, don't keep, keep the depth down there and then use another VCA for the depth. Okay, so we go LFO out. 
Um, which means that actually, interesting, okay, which means that actually my modulation that's changing the Kiminiak already, that needs to be um, mixed. So I've got another CV mixer down here. So what I'll do is I'll use, instead of using maths, I'll use this as a CV mixer and I'll dial it in about where it was in maths. And then um, I'll use the output of whatever my um, voltage control of the LFO out is. I'm going to put in the second one. Oh, does that actually do a CV mixing? Does it do CV mixing? I'm not sure it does. Do I have another CV mixer here? Maybe I've run up, run towards the limits of my CV mixing. Hmm. Oh no, it does, it does. Okay, that's cool. So I can add this one. So if I were to just grab this by itself, it should, yeah, so let's let's just see when it's at full blast. It's probably totally gnarly. Oh, we can dial that back. Let's have a listen. There we go. Okay, so instead of going there, we're gonna go from here. So we've got dynamic control. And let's do it from, let's use um, the yellow channel of um, the first, uh, so the first channel of Sapel to be my modulation source. So I can open this right up because I've got control over the offset in Sapel itself. So I'm basically what I'm doing is I'm mixing um, to modulate the, the phase position of the Kiminiak phaser. I've doubled out the B output of my Worcester sequencer, which is controlling this original ebb and flow. All right. And I'm mixing that with the LFO output. I'm mixing that with the LFO output of, whoops, I forgot to connect that, um, of the internal Kaminiak. LFO. I mean, it could be any LFO, but it just ha so happens to have one in there. So I'm kind of moving that outwards and then doing this um, as an external kind of CV control of that. Um, that's good. And then I've got a CV source. Uh, so I'm mixing those two together. At the moment, we don't have the internal um, LFO affecting it, but I can open it up manually. Okay, so this attenuator is wide open and I'm using this offset because that's where I'm going to dynamically control that. Okay, so now it's getting random values from the yellow Sapel channel. And that yellow Sapel channel is the thing that's clocking the original sequence. I really don't have any... I don't, I'm not doing any modulation of the bifold, but let's have a listen without the... So just with the two trigger sources. Thank you. 
I'm just going. I'm just going to finish this off. I may come back to it. Um, it may be a continuation of the video, or I might just do it myself. Um, but just to kind of recap, before I run out of camera battery, um, essentially um, I've taken one source, which the idea was to use some kind of subharmonics from um, Felistri. Um, I'm syncing that with the green um, uh, Felistri function, syncing the yellow um, Felistri function. I've used the Sapel as a um, as a stable clock, which is clocking the Uster sequencer. I've got two outputs from the Uster sequencer track one. A is changing the um, the rise time of my synchronized Felistri envelope, um, which is was originally giving me these kind of subharmonics, which is cool. Um, B is giving me some dynamic variation over that because I'm I'm um, putting that through uh, LPG before it goes to the channel. So that was cool. Then I had a jittering envelope. The jittering envelope comes from maths. Um, I originally started with the CV output, but now I'm using the trigger output because that gives me some interesting um, uh, kind of pinging things. And I'm mixing that in with the original um, envelope that was controlling uh, volume. That gave me a kind of a, a balance between um, jitter and more um, fluid modulation. Um, it was too present, so I used some fluctuating random voltage and a, and a VCA to open up and close the, um, the pinging. And then I started evolving a second source. Oh no, before I did that, I decided that I would play around with some frequency modulation of um, either the synchronizing envelope or function or the synchronized. And I decided that actually it sounded better if I um, frequency modulated the, um, the synchronized uh, function, uh, the yellow function. And so I've taken that from just a, a static um, tone from Brenso's modulation oscill oscillator, the green oscillator. Um, and I've got some dynamic variation on that coming from um, the green Sapel channel. Um, so, and that green Sapel channel is being triggered by that jittering envelope. So that's cool. And then I moved into a second source. That second source is just taking um, the same sound, which is my um, f my modulation, my frequency modulation, but I'm taking the triangle wave, and then I'm um, I'm going through uh, an LPG um, into this kind of phaser wave shaping combo. I originally had it going first into the wave shaper and then into the Kaminyak phaser and then out. I found that I, I had more opportunity for um, for timbre variation if I went from the phaser into the um, the wave shaper. Um, and then as I was doing that, of course, I had kind of panning that I'd I'd played around with using the same sample and hold, um, sorry, a sample and hold that was being triggered by the maths channel. Um, and then um, I thought, well, actually, I've got some other modulation sources that I can use um, to play around with timbral variation and like frequency modulation. And before I did that, I realized that I actually also wanted these two to be dynamically related. And those two are dynamically related because I'm taking the negative CV, which is controlling volume of my pings, and I'm using that to control the volume of the second source, which means that as the, the pings get louder, the second source gets softer. When the pings get softer, the second source gets louder. So let's just hear them together before I stop the video. And I've got some delay in there too. So there's still a sense of regularity, same pitch on each, a cycle of modulation that goes around, but there's enough variation for me to hear this ebb and flow going before I then choose to either work on something performative 
or to add another switch. Cool. All right, I'll stop that there and um, yeah, I'll decide whether or not I continue with the video or I just leave it there.